Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 134 for Thursday, October 5th, 2017. <music> Greetings, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Los Gatos, California, it's Paul Kent. How goes it, man? Well, I will say it doesn't go great today, Dave. You know, we lost one of my heroes this week, and I know over the course of time we've been doing this, there have been a lot of heroes that have been lost. We lost Bowie, and and we lost Glenn Frey, and Glenn Fry, and... Yep. But uh, losing Tom Petty, that's a big one for me. That's a that's a that's a top two for me. And wow, I just saw him a month ago. I which know. Is incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It made me think, actually, when um, when I saw that he had he had passed, it made me think that perhaps his laryngitis might have been more than a little bit of laryngitis back when uh, when when he had to postpone his show a couple of days for you. Yeah, that's a probably a smart thing to assume. Yeah. I, you know, there's a lot of recordings of Petty where he doesn't look well. He didn't look well that night. He sounded the same, yep. but he didn't look well. I mean, he, you know, there's, if you look at stuff over the last couple of years, his hand shakes terribly and, you know, and he had, I, I think he lived a, a rock star life for a while. I mean, I think that's pretty well documented, but. Yep. Well, I th- and but, I think that's it, right? I mean, all of these 66 guys. Six years old. I know. It, I think what we're learning and and I, and I'm going to generalize here, but, but it sure seems like, we're learning that, you know, cocaine might kill more people than cigarettes down the road. Um, people that, you know, people that wind up using a lot of Coke, I think it, it, it burns it. I don't know. It's like, they're just not lasting. Yeah. Yeah. It's a shame. I, I, it yeah. is. It's terrible. I mean, you again, know? this, I, I, I think I was pretty transparent. You know, when Bowie passed, like I was acknowledging that this is yeah. one of the giant names, but it didn't like. It didn't, it didn't me- affect you. Yeah. Didn't pause me like that. And and when, when Glenn passed, you know, again, I, that's more music that I connected with, yeah. but he wasn't someone that I connected with. That, that paused me more yep. than I expected I it. Yeah, exactly. More than I expected it to. And it's still, it's like, man, huh? Yeah. Yeah. But Petty, man, that's like, I can tell you every Petty show I've been to, and there've been many, I can tell you, you know, the amazing connections that I've had. I, you know, I saw Petty first time I saw Petty was 77, a show at Stanford university. I still can't find it referenced anywhere on site. So I wonder if it was like an off night and they just threw in an extra show, but you know, it was right after the second album came out. I loved the first album and then, you know, but they weren't, they didn't blow up. Right. And, and then, you know, the second album, and then he was playing, you know, not far from my house and a buddy and I went and it was just a great, Great rock and roll show. I saw him with my whole family at Outside Lands a couple of years ago, yep. which was incredibly memorable. And I just saw him. You knew that this last one that, you know, it was getting towards the end, you know, uh, and, but I saw him, you know, with the good friends again. And, and uh, I saw him with with Mud Crutch two times, yeah. you know, in, in little places. And I didn't get to see him. He did um, 20 nights at the Fillmore here in San yeah. Francisco. Yeah. And I don't even remember why I didn't see him. But every time I think about that run and I didn't get a chance to see him. And I, basically uh-huh. an, an oversized club is really what the Fillmore yeah, is. Yeah, that's why it's all it is. That's right. Yep. And yeah, it's, uh, just a, it's just a big rock club is what it yeah. is. Yep. yep. But, you know, it, it, it's still I, I'm still kind of numb to it. And um, I, I was thinking in preparation for this show about, you know, what all the gifts that Petty left for classic rock cover musicians, you know, and, and there are many of them. I think you could arguably, arguably say more than anybody else. I'm trying to think about who, who's, who has more songs covered besides the Beatles and the Stones, probably who has more classic rock in the canon of classic rock than Petty. Can you think anybody? Uh, Maybe Skinner, but I don't think so. No, no, no. I mean, you know, I don't think so. Uh, same town, right? Aren't they from the same place? They're from close. Yeah. Close, right? Yeah. Jacksonville and Gainesville, I think. Jacksonville and Gainesville. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. But, um, and you know, the, the whole story of Petty, like, you know, he had a great, um, a biography came out about him last year, was really very well done. And uh, 
the whole story, Petty, is really just one of those magical rock and roll stories to me. Again, we're talking about, you know, Southern Florida and, and or, or Northern Florida. And again, there were some really amazing talent. Some of the guys who founded the Eagles came out of his community. Some of the guys from the Allman Brothers came out of his community. Yep. So there was some talent. But it's not like you're picking guys from Juilliard, you know, for, for forming bands in, in this in this scene. Right. Right. Yet. Yet the stuff that Petty did and, you know, the musicians that he had to find a piano player like Ben Montench with that amount of taste and touch to find a genre defining guitar player like Mike Campbell out of that pool. When you're in your teens, young teens, actually, is even more amazing. It's not like, again, you're not pulling from seasoned road dogs, you know, nope. that uh, that, you know, have a reputation, that type of stuff, but that they kind of melded created that sound, created those songs. And the songs are, you know, to be fair to me, the songs are 50% great writing and 50% great playing. I mean, you know, it's just passion. Again, American yeah. girl, American girl, you know, that beat, where'd that beat come from, man? Yeah. It, oh, it's where'd true. Run? Yeah. It's a weird group. I mean, we, 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 you know, we just did an episode about it. Right. That's right. Yep. But that's what I'm saying. That kind of serendipitous magic that, yep the rock and roll story kind of promises everybody. Well, and they were, I mean, they always were that, and I don't want to dismiss them. I don't want to be dismissive about this, but they were the garage band that just sort of made it happen. But yep. they were the garage band that could write killer songs and then deliver those songs. And That's I, it. from what I've heard, and you are a, you are far more versed in, in the history of Tom Petty than me, but from what I've heard, he was, like obsessive in the studio about getting things right it, with the, not only with the right performance, but with the right energy it combined with it. And, um, but, you know, I mean, he was, he was dedicated to his craft, even though his craft wasn't this, you know, refined, uh, you know, overly, I don't want to say over. No, over there's it's three minute, it's exactly. three minute, three, four chord songs, right? Yes. Right. Three minutes, three chords and the truth. That's it. Right. You know, <laughs> well, but really, right. Maybe four chords, but you know, it's fine. <laughs> that's what he does. That's what he did. And that's what well, he left for us. Yeah. And that I was, uh, that's all part of that magical story. You know, when they're, when they're heading to LA from Florida and they get connected with Denny Cordell, a guy who produced the Moody Blues and, you know, just, you know, this amazing producer. And if you listen to that first Petty album, it doesn't sound like anything else that was on the record at the time uh, right. that was on the radio at the time. And the layering of guitars and the interesting, you know, not just not just doubling, but like doubling with slight differences that made the song just kind of like this ethereal sound. And that's what I'm saying. There's a, there's, it, it is a rock and roll story. These guys from Florida, from Florida, you know, versed in fifties, sixties rock. Yeah. Getting hooked up, you know, with, with a guy who knew what to do with them and giving them a sound. And then their chops evolving from there. in real time yeah. into this amazing stuff. Again, I, I, I think I've told you this before. I love Bruce and that's, that that serves my soul in many ways. Sure, but if I could play in any out in any band, it would always have been the Heartbreakers. The way that band sounded, two guitars, bass, drums, and keys, and and uh, uh, just always just lit me up, man. And and did all the way through their career, everything from that first album. And I guess you know the first song most people you know if you if you caught on to them early, Breakdown was probably the first song you, you caught on to, right? Sure. Yep. So and that, again, that was just a different groove. And then that, you know, that guitar fill in the middle is just like this yeah. Chuck Berry inspired, but taken three levels up, you know, and it was just, it was a different sound. It just, as a young musician, it just turned your head around 10 ways from Sunday. You, c you couldn't dance to it. It's too small. It's not, it's not a slow song, not a fast song, yeah. but it just had this, <laughs> it just grooved, right? And it just got into you and it just, it just held you. And then on from there, then, you know, they get to... I guess in the second album, uh, listen to her heart. So yeah. you, now, now it sounds like the birds, right. But with a better jangle than the birds had. No. Yeah. 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 That's right. Yeah. It was feel a whole lot better, better. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's yeah. great. Yeah. yeah. Yep. I know. And uh, It's crazy. Yeah. And then, you know, there was always great rock cuts in the first one. I, 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 do you know all his albums pretty well? Like, do you know, <laughs> so, from most albums? you know, the interesting thing about Tom Petty for me is when I was, you know, kind of coming up and and starting to to really kind of get into music. I hated 
everything about Tom Petty. Huh. Uh, because it was, it was like, too simple. it was too simple. Yeah, exactly. It was like, Oh, come on. I mean, what are these guys out there doing? They're just like, this isn't like the rush and the yes and the ELP and, and, and that, you know, stuff that I was listening to. Then I want to talk about, uh, the, the yes show I saw last night, either in this episode or, or perhaps the next one. But, um, it, you know, so I just didn't like them. And uh, and almost made it a point. It was almost a badge of honor. It was like, no, 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 not Tom Petty, <laughs> not Tom Petty. And then invariably, as has happened with many other bands, uh, I got into a, a band and one of the tunes that they covered was a Tom Petty song or whatever. And I was like, OK, all right, fine. And uh, honestly, it might have been the Macworld All-Star Band. I mean, like I, I kept Petty at bay for a long time and uh and then, you know, I started playing it and that forces me, of course, to to thankfully, I like all those walls about what I hate and don't like and all that stuff just don't exist when I'm learning a song to play it. And, yeah. it, and that has served me well in many ways, this being one of them. And so, you know, I got into the tunes. It's like, oh, this is a great song. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and then and then really got into Petty and, and did wind up going to see him live. Uh, I want to say five or six years ago, Lisa and I went. I think Petty was was my wife Lisa's first concert um, ever. And so th this hit her pretty hard. But I was impressed when I went and saw him. Uh, you know, I mean, it was like, oh, this is like a great band on stage. That's yeah. like, of course. Yeah. These guys are great. Yep. Well, it was a rock and roll band when things were going in a lot of different directions. Totally. You know? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. So that first album, you know, Breakdown and American Girl, I don't remember which hit first. Yeah. Uh, which was, I, I think Breakdown was the first single release and American Girl was the second. I think Breakdown was actually in 76. Okay. American Girl was in 77. But on that album, that first album, which still I can listen to over and over. I never get tired of that. Stranger in the Night just has this amazing groove. Fooled Again had that, you know, that that pad, you know, while the minor chords kind of flow through it. Yep. Love that song. Mystery Man goes back to like a, goes back to like a, kind of a cross between Roy Orbison. And that was the thing about this music is that it, it channeled everything that came before it and made it sound new and modern again. Right. He was not afraid to uh, highlight. I was going to say not even afraid to show his influences, but not afraid to highlight them. Like he, yep. he was happy with who his influences were and it was okay that you knew. In fact, yep. if you didn't know that probably would have upset him. So Yeah. <laughs> Right. Mike, I mean, Cam Mike Campbell is my all time favorite guitar player. I mean, I, there are many guitar players I like. Sure. But his tone and his taste, you know, like like people love Jimmy Page, but not everybody. Uh, and they, and, they, and anyone who listens to Jimmy Page will, will appreciate Jimmy Page. Sure. Um, but there's, you know, Jimmy Page had a very unique style, uh, you know, this kind of like very heavy blues style. Totally. Yeah. But Campbell plays blues country never wastes a note totally respects space i mean i he just blows me away i like if i could sit down with any guitar player it'd be mike campbell huh. if i just wanted to get into his mind and figure out and but again how did how do you get to be that guy how do you how do your chops evolve where the influences around you get inside you and make you a player that nobody else in the world is yep it's amazing yep. and again not talking about Berkeley College of Music, Juilliard, you nope. know, we're talking about guys who are just you become the sum of your influences and you take it to a place that nobody's ever taken it before. Campbell just blows me away. And again, the chops that he has kind of starts with, you know, it's based around based around Chuck Berry. But then you get all these great, you, know, you get this, this um, James Burton influences and you get, you know, guy knows how to use open strings to ring while he's working around his riffs and other right, ways. Right. Just totally. fantastic, tasty player. Yep. Fantastic. And again, this guy, again, you know, how did he end up in the cosmic sense of things? How did he end up with Tom Petty to make <laughs> those songs come alive? It's, you know, it, it's, a, it's like the Beatles, right? And yes. the Stones. Like, yes. You're not picking from Juilliard in Liverpool in, in the in the early, late 50s, right? Nope. <laughs> That's totally but, true. Uh, yeah. The, the sum of the parts, you know, is amazing. So, but uh, going back to my original point, Petty has left the classic rock musician, the cover musician. Was, and these songs, you know how we talk a lot about how there are the songs that you can do almost anything to and they'll still go over well in a bar, yeah, right? Totally. And, you know, we talk about, Sweet Home Alabama. We talk about Honky Tonk Woman. Yep. Petty's Petty's entire hit canon 
is that. And, and even when petty stuff started getting more interesting, like don't come around here no more. Yeah. Um, you know, as he got into like more sonic changes, you can dumb them down for a, for a bar band and it still make people dream with them. And that's, that's, that transcends everything, man. That yep. just, yep. it's incredible. Yeah. You have a favorite, you have a favorite petty song now that you're back into him? Um, God, you know, I don't, I don't know that I do. I mean, I have, I, I have songs of his that I like, but I've never really dug in and, and, um, so, you know, but listen to her heart is, is certainly up there. It's one of my favorite songs to play, uh, because it's just got, a, it's got a great groove, right? I mean, it's a, that song is a very simple, straightforward groove, but, um, but it's not, it, it's deceptively simple, right? I mean, you've got to drive it just right. And then singing those harmonies that sort of just float over it. Yeah. It is very much like, in fact, the, the physical experience of playing that song on the drums and, and singing the harmonies on that is very similar to feel a whole lot better. Um, I obviously feel a whole lot better is faster and, and that sort of thing. And I think that's part of the magic of, of listen to her heart is it's, it's a relaxed tempo that, but still, it still moves. So yeah, it floats, it floats that, that, and that is exactly the right way to think about that song driving that groove is it has to float and it's a good one to open shows with. I think they opened the, yeah. the show I saw with it. Um, and we've done it in fling as a, as an opener many times. Um, and it's a, because it's a great opener. It, it's not, you know, you're not beating people over the head, but you're also not easing into the show. I mean, you're playing a song that, you know, that you got to deliver. Uh, and it's also just sonically interesting. It, like the, the, the guitar good. riff is. Yeah. yeah. And the, all the instruments work, you know, the stones have this term for how their guitars weave in and out each other. They call it weaving. Yeah, right. They, yeah. Yeah. The whole pity band does that. I mean, they're simple structural songs. It's true. But the bass lines are very melodic and the guitars are there or not there in really interesting ways. And the piano playing is just so gorgeous. I oh, mean, yeah. they, they, all the keyboard playing, I mean, that's really a world-class musician. So tasty. How about the straight ahead rockers? You ever play You Wreck Me? You and I have played it. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. In fact, I had never heard that song before you, you know, said, oh, we should play You Wreck Me. I was like, oh, oh right, I fine. love that song. Man. Yeah, yeah. That's why I'm thinking it might have, it really might have been the all-star band was the first place I was, I was really exposed to. Tom That's Petty. pretty long into your, That's into what your I'm saying. It was career. a long road. Yeah. Oh. I mean, it was right at that time. I can't remember if it was the responders or, or the all-star band. Cause in the responders we played like won't back down and uh, we might've played. I think we played listen to her heart in that band too, um, which we also wound up playing in the all-stars and then, um, and then, and then you wreck me, but yeah, I mean, that's a really fun one to play. That was the first song I wanted to play, you know, that rocks, it rocks. And that was the first song I played when I heard he passed. It was like, oh, all right, that's the one yep. I want to hear. Yep. Yeah. How about refugee. You ever play refugee? Yeah. That's a hard one to play correctly. That's that, that's not your typical bar band song. I don't think. Yeah. Well, yeah. there's like, there's like a breath and an accent, you Correct. know, in really key places there. Correct. And breakdowns, not Dynamic. easy to play either. Like to keep that groove without, without it speeding up and like holding that it's yeah, it's good. Yeah. 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 Trying to think of other great. So we play refugee in the house rockers. We, we took it. He played it with a horn section at uh, like a live aid or a farm okay. aid or something like that. Yeah. And so we added, we had that horn line to it and that's still one that people, people just love. You know, I'll, I'll tell you after he passed, I had a, a gig scheduled up at a local winery here sure. and I, and it's my next gig because I'm tied up for a couple of weeks and I knew I really wanted to do something for Tom Petty. And sure. so I, I called a couple of guys and I said, Hey, should we do a Tom Petty night? Right. I made a Facebook event. I saw. Yeah. And there's like 160 people in a day, you know, saying they're interested in coming. So, you, you know, capitalists, you No, no. I, I mean, <laughs> I'm trying to like keep it chill and just be like, you know, let's all get together and sing Tom Petty songs. But yeah, I mean, it sure could feel that way. It, it not, wasn't my intent, but I would understand if somebody accused me of that. Yeah, but, no, uh, no, 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 no. It, I mean, it, the timing of those things, if it works, can be great. We played a gig right after Glenn Fry died and we wound up playing, you know, like almost, almost a set of Eagles tunes. Yeah. And it was like the whole bar, you know, you couldn't, it was magic. 
And and so this is I think it's great to do this. And if it winds up, you know, making everybody some money, fine. But, you know, there you go. I mean, yeah. we musicians, we do deserve to get paid. It's OK. <laughs> yeah. Know. Well, this is actually this is actually my gig that I had. Yeah. And I and I put a band together. So I'm, I'm going to pay him out of my stuff. Sure. And it's a it's free to get into this place. Oh, so you there know? you so, go. Oh, yeah. So, so yeah, yeah. but I'm but It'll actually be a good a point, night, though, I bet. I, I think it will be. But but. um you know, the funny thing is like most of the people responding to this, I'm watching it kind of gain its virality. I don't know most of the people who are saying they're coming to this. That's and so, it, you know, just kind of getting out. It is kind of cool. Uh, and again, the common denominator is Tom. It's so cool to me. Women. I mean, everybody loves Tom Petty. Women love Tom Petty. And I don't even know what the message is in the songs or what the imagery is in the songs that connects with females in such a unique way. Um, I think it's just this kind of starry dreaming character characteristic yeah. of, of, of the, yeah, of the he wasn't lyric. a good looking guy ever. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So it, it definitely is, you know, it's in the songs. Yeah. 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 So I, so, I will, I will say, um, it, you know, as, as the, as the, the working musician here, and I'll steal a line from yes, capitalize on this good fortune, right. Where you want to, Make sure you get your mailing list there. Right. If you're if you're fortunate enough to tr attract people that don't know who you are. Yeah. Like make sure like it's I mean, go do the petty thing and it's great. And there's nothing wrong with that. And there's also nothing wrong with making sure that everybody there has the opportunity to sign up on your mailing list and, and find out more about what you're going to do next. Yeah. I mean, it, you, you do get the credit for being the the, the bringer together of people. Yes. So that's that's a good thing. Absolutely. There are two there are two excellent petty um, tribute bands in my area. One's called Petty Theft and they they <laughs> actually. Funny. Yeah. Yeah. And they actually work quite a bit and and get gigs kind of up and down California and the, and the West Coast. And then my buddy Jody has a band called The Refugees. They're excellent. And Jody sounds a lot like like Tom Petty. Huh. And, uh, you know. It's interesting. Do, will they work more or, you know, it's like, it's like after Prince passed away, all these people yeah. passing away after yeah, Prince yeah. passed away. I have a friend who has a, who has a Prince tribute act sure. and uh, their, their business exploded. So I don't, I don't know if Jody's band will, you know, I get a lot more demand. I sure hope so. Cause I guess, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we talk about the business and all those types of things, but ultimately the art that you would really think deserves to live forever that uh, that the music will just be around for people to hear and enjoy and, you know, share memories with people. Like yeah. I said, I, that's the biggest thing that's hit me is like, holy crap. I, I listen to Tom Petty just about every day. Right. Wow. That, yeah, I mean, he's yeah. just there and he's always waiting for the next tour the, or the next album. And that's, you know, cold water dose of reality that there's not going to be a next album or, or another tour. And, uh, you know, it's pretty crazy. It is really 66, man. 66. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's too young. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. But that's how it goes. You know, I mean, thank goodness we, um, I'm, I'm thankful that I finally got, you know, that it, I mean, it took me a while, but I, you know, I became very appreciative of his, of his music and I'm glad I got to see him. Yeah. What do you think got you to that place? Was it, was it like, you know, this guy has established himself as, you know, one of the hallmarks of this music that of mute rock music that I like, or was it literally that the songs themselves started talking to you? I mean, Oh no, it was definitely the songs. And that, yeah. and like I said, that's been the case with lots of bands for me. Yeah. Uh, we've talked about this where, yeah, it just, I have to learn the song and I, you know, there's no reason to be half-assed about that for me. Like if I'm going to bother to, to play a song, I'm going to play it, you know, and that's fine. And I, I don't have to like it. it so it, I just go in and I play the song. And then it's it's not only I mean, it can at that from that point forward, it can be a number of fact. Like sometimes there's songs that I still play that I just I would never choose to listen to. But I'm happy to play them. No problem. Yeah. Um, but with, you know, with with some stuff, it's just the song itself that's like, whoa, how did I miss out on this? You know, and others, it's. Well, look how people react to this. Like, and, and then you start to see it through someone else's eyes. And you're right. Like, oh, okay. You know, and, and you're able to sort of experience that in a very visceral way, uh, playing this song and seeing people react and feeling people react and all that. So sometimes that's it too. But with Petty, 
I think it was um, the, you know, those, those REM had already convinced me that I like jangly guitars. Right. So I, it, so I came, <laughs> I came to this in, in like sort of a backwards way. Right. But, um, and then harmonies too. It's like, Oh, yeah. holy crap. Like this band, there's so much here. How did I, I, I missed this because I was being a jackass and just saying, oh, I don't like Tom Petty. And, you know, I put on an elitist. Badge. I was totally being an elitist. And then it just became a thing. I mean, it it went well beyond just being an elitist, um, including like in Go Figure, the band I was in in, in college. I wrote a, a song called Running Down. And every time somebody would build a set list, they would write Running Down a Dream. Yeah. On there just to piss me off. Like, you know, like, oh, you, you hate Tom Petty and yet you wrote a song that's named the same as his. I'm like, it's not the same name. But um, but, you know, yeah, I, I think with him, it was it was actually just the music. Yeah. Which yeah. is which is great. You know, it's fine. I I, I look think? forward to discovering new stuff all the time. So yeah. and that's my discovery mechanism. A lot of the time is just what song I'm going to play. And so Eddie's had two official drummers and one unofficial drummer. So, you know, uh, Stan Lynch started with the band. Right. And uh, and then Steve Ferroni has been with the band for a long time. Ferroni's, Ferroni was a, a known monster before he joined the Heartbreakers, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, because yeah. he was with the Average White Band right before that. Oh. Right? I did not know that. I think am, I, right. am I getting that wrong? I don't think I'm getting that wrong. I, I think that's right. But I'll, I'll look it up and make sure. So, uh yeah, he was he was with the average white band, and then and then his you know is a studio monster. Yeah, yeah. But he he's the one that I obviously that I saw with that band, and yeah. oh gosh, uh, you know, just like ten seconds into the show, seeing him play that groove of "Listen to Your Heart" changed yeah. everything for me. It was like, oh, I gotta, oh, holy crap! Like th th this guy's hands are like butter. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. I told you, like I, we've talked about drums and drum sounds before. The, the sound of his snare is perfectly between pop and snap, right? It's yep. just, it is the most melodic sounding snare that I've ever heard. Yeah. And I love it. And the whole I, kit. And I don't, I don't think that's just his drums though. I, I, hands. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, yep. I mean, he, certainly his drums are, you know, always good quality drums and he tunes them well, but, but I, I think especially that snare sound, and his hi-hat sound, like the way that was what really impressed me was, you know, he played it, it, like you said, that song's got a float. And and so for me, I always would go to the ride symbol to to play it because you just got it like that's the way to make it float. And seeing and hearing him make it float, keeping it on the hi-hat was like, oh, there's a whole other level here. So, yeah, it's good. You know, when you go to a petty show, you get everything just kind of from the drummer perspective, you get driving rock beats you get you know these kind of interesting beats you get you know songs that are completely played on rim right you get shakers yep. you know you you get this sonic experience that that amplifies the mood of the songs in such a beautiful way totally and i actually think it's a that's a good lesson for you know cover bands it, it is not comfortable to break your show down you know, take the risk of, of losing the energy to go for something a little bit more moody every, every once in a while. But remember, there's nothing happening in the heartbreakers. There's no prefabricated sounds nope. that you couldn't recreate if you wanted to, you know? Totally. And again, there's a lot in the magic of the songs about how, how space is built into the songs and that does the work for you. So, I mean, I just think there's so much to learn that is a, like you said, it's a, it's a, it's a garage band made good. Um, did you know Dave Grohl was, was a drummer for the Heartbreakers for a very, very, very short I, time? I remember that. Yeah, that's right. I, I knew that. Yeah, it's yeah, actually yeah. a pretty funny story. So when he fired Stan Lynch, his first drummer, and they needed a drummer, they had a Saturday Night Live gig coming up. And, uh, and Grohl is, has been interviewed saying that he got a call and uh, they asked him if he would, if he would do the, do the gig with him. And Roll's line was me. Why don't they, why don't they get somebody good? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's why we love Dave Kroll. Absolutely. It's because of the, He's every man. He, he, well, kind of, I mean, he relates to every man. Yeah. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, he's not every man, right? Well, he's a rock star. He, yeah. But, but he's always been a rock star. Like I, his, his attitude, his commitment, it, his drive, all of that, it like is way beyond the average person. If the average person had that, 
they would also be rock stars <laughs> in whatever field they chose. But like, he's like, so much more relatable. That, like, like Mick Jagger is a rock star, but yes. he wouldn't. Right. Right. He's aloof. It, yeah. I mean, he's you know, he's he's English and he's cheeky and all that stuff. But but he is an aloof dude, uh, Jagger, whereas as Dave Grohl is absolutely like he's got a charisma that just won't quit. <laughs> I told you I peed next to Dave Grohl once. Right. Yes. You did share the pee story. I did. Yeah. Really nice guy. In fact, he he talked to security guard off of me, which was sort of nice because I was just peeing when he came in to, to do the same thing. And his guards like, you can't be in here. Like, yeah, dude, I'm doing a thing here <laughs> right now. Right? I can. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Huh? Good old yeah, so I put together uh, a, a band to do this this petty night. Yep. Uh, interesting. Simon is the only one who I've ever played with. I've got a bass player who's a buddy of mine and said he's wanted to do some things together. Oh, no, there's one other guy who's played. Our buddy Chris Breen is going to play keys on it. Oh, sweet. So oh, you have another great. connection to this. Yeah. Uh, so I sent them, um, I think, 20 songs okay. uh, in two weeks. I know them all. I, was, I would that guess was, that Chris knows them all, too, based on... Uh, based on what we've, what we know of Chris too. I, yeah. I don't think he knows them all, but he was in a pretty good place. Okay. Uh, uh, the other guys have got some woodshedding to do. Um, but it, my point was, uh, I, I didn't realize I knew them all. Like almost immediately upon trying to put the set list together and thinking about a song, you know, again, the, 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 the chord structures are not rocket science, but um, it's amazing what's inside of you with something like this. Like, how the easily the songs and the lyrics, which I've shared many times is the hardest thing for me. Yeah. I didn't even realize I knew as much of the lyrics as I do. And so I think the band is going to do 20 songs. I think I'm going to do, I'm going to open it with an acoustic number and close it with an acoustic number. It's, uh, it's, uh, at a winery, so we can't get too loud. Oh yeah. It's at that place you and I played, right? It's that's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and again, it's October 19th. It's out outdoor gig. It'll be a little cooler, yeah. you know, so a couple of interesting things, but again, the interest in it seems to be really, really high. So I just put it out there and all of a sudden all these people are, are, are awesome. signing off. And then right. I said, well, that place you know, is going to be packed. Holy yeah, yeah. crap. Yeah. That's not a huge then, place. Yeah. Yeah. And then I said, you know, if you have a party of six or more, you should get um, reservations. And it seems like a lot of people are doing that. And so I actually, I'm probably gonna have to shut it down at some point in time because, yeah. you know, you don't want to disappoint people and you don't want to cause problems with too many people overrunning the place and that type of thing. So yeah, I mean, if 150 people showed up at that place, I feel like packed. that would be, yeah. Interesting. Uh -huh. Yeah. Huh? Well, that's but cool. Anyway, yeah. yeah. So then, and it, I just feel this intense need to say thanks to Tom Petty. I mean, I, I'm surprised that I'm feeling as much as I feel. Sure. Um, but there was always Tom Petty every day of the year. There was Tom Petty. It was on the radio. Yeah. It was on my playlist. It was in my, if I picked up my guitar, there was always a Petty riff or a Petty song, you know, or something on, on television or something like that. And I loved it all. I mean, literally, I can't think of any music that he's put out that I dislike, but, but there's some stuff. And much, a lot of stuff. I mean, the last DJ swinging, um, uh, just so many that are just so freaking fantastic throughout his career. Yeah, All he, of had, he had out. the ability to do to do very uh, magical things with songwriting. There's a, um, uh, a like a six hour documentary on Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers that came huh. out a few years ago. You can get it on, you can get it on like iTunes or Amazon or something like that. And it's like I said, it's six hours and it's really very detailed about their whole career. I, I, that along with the book, the biography, I think are pretty good studies in Tom Petty. But um, one of the really interesting things is an interview with, when he started working with Rick Rubin. And I think that was around, you're going to get it. And uh, you know, Rick Rubin's pretty well known working with more like Beastie Boys, modern bands. And uh, he was saying like, I've been in a room with Tom Petty where he just channels a song. Like you watch an idea kind of waft into him. Something in, <laughs> something in the room is happening yeah. and you could see the wheels start going and you watch him channel it immediately to his hands. And he starts, you know, recording a song, playing a song, writing down a song. And he just said it was, it was that type of thing. Hmm. And again, that that's, that's the magic of all this. You know, I, I've said this a few times on the show that, you know, rock and roll is the great common denominator. You, you don't have to be, you can be inspired and find something that connects with people through rock and roll 
And then, you know, it, the other genres are not quite as accessible that way. I don't think even the blues, you know, because I, I think people get as heavy handed as, as they can be with the blues sometimes, but, but rock and roll is like, you know, a very simple thought told in a very truthful, transparent manner can, can create something that'll last forever. I mean, it's, yeah. it's really remarkable to me. There's. Well, we'll see. I, I mean, y- you know, um, we, and I mean, to a much larger degree, you, but you know, we grew up with this stuff as it was happening. I'm curious where like, like Tom Petty, like my kids are aware of Tom Petty music, but it's not, they're, they're aware of it because of me. Whereas like the Beatles, have they i mean they became aware of it because of us but but for especially for my daughter like the beatles have become something her own right for for her and um i would challenge that man i'll tell you why you i just don't you're you're one of those beatles fans right there there was no way your kids were going to come into this world and not be exposed to beatles stuff in a very deep and meaningful way yeah yeah. and you know this is the way but but i mean like a lot of their friends have gotten into the Beatles, a lot are into like Pink Floyd, which my kids aren't really Led Zeppelin. I mean, there's, there's, there's kids their age, their friends that are deep into these things. I don't see Petty showing up as much there. Huh. Yeah. And maybe, I mean, I haven't stopped. I'm just, I'm just thinking about it, you know, sort of anecdotally here while we're having this discussion, but Petty's not the thing that those kids, like when I see, we, cause I experience a lot of uh, teenagers bands, yeah. right. And Petty is never on that list. Interesting. Yeah. Unfortunate. Yeah. It's, it's, it's old guys music. Uh, I think. Mm-hmm. So I'm curious to see, you know, if, you know, w- what happens with that, um, so uh, who knows? Well, time will certainly tell. I mean, yeah, I'd like exactly. to think that as long as as long as somebody wants to pick up a guitar, a petty tune is not going to be too far away. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. All it's right. true. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, rest in peace, Thomas Earl Petty. His birthday's coming up on October 20th. Would have been 67 years old. I think he gave he gave us art and made us feel alive in ways few ever could. And I just want to say it'll be terribly missed. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. No more, uh, no more music coming from him. And that's kind of sad. So in fact, that's more than kind of sad. So yeah. Thanks for listening, folks. We will, uh, we'll see you next week. And, uh, play a Tom Petty song this weekend. Folks. There you go. Yeah. Pick your favorite, pick anybody's favorite. It doesn't matter. You'll like it by the time you get to the end of it. Trust me. <laughs> Always be performing. It'll work Always. out. This week be performing Petty. Petty.